Happy New Year to you all. I am delighted to be starting 2022 with you, and I look forward to shaking up history together again this year. Before we jump into the year ahead, I thought it would be good to spend an episode looking back. Last month, I asked what your memorable moments in history were. I deliberately kept the question vague because I really wanted to hear whatever you were thinking about. Thank you so much to everyone who shared their favorite memorable moments. It was a great collection. Some shared favorite things that happened during 2021, and others shared favorite moments from British history through time. All such great comments. I've compiled an eclectic list of your ideas. I had to stop at 10, so unfortunately, I didn't get to include every idea I heard. However, I made note of them all, and I'll do my best to explore them during the year. As always, I'd love to hear what bits of British history you want to know more about. So please reach out to me. You can find me on my website, carolannlloyd.com, or email me at carolann at carolannlloyd.com. Also, I'm all over Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as at ShakeUpHistory. So please let me know what you're thinking. Here we go. The Top 10 2021 historic, memorable moments, not all of which actually happened in 2021. Coming in at number 10 is the milestones of the modern royal family. Now, as you know, I try to steer pretty clear of the modern royals, especially the controversy surrounding them. It's all a bit divisive right now, and most of us don't really know what's going on. Although, I have to admit, I do have some opinions. But the historic moment of 2021 is really important, especially as we embark on 2022, when we will mark the 70th year of the reign of Her Majesty the Queen. So which historic event happened that was really important in 2021? A clue. I'm not talking about that interview. In fact, it was more of a personal moment, the death of the Duke of Edinburgh on the 9th of April, 2021. He was 99 years old and would have celebrated his 100th birthday just a couple of months later. Prince Philip had retired in August 2017, but he did make a few more public appearances at family occasions, such as Princess Beatrice's wedding. The official statement of his death read, quote, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle, close quote. The funeral plans had been in place for years, but they had to be modified significantly because of COVID-19. The image of the Queen sitting alone in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle was a powerful sign of her new reality without Philip by her side. In her Christmas speech of 2021, the Queen began by saying, quote, Although it's a time of great happiness and good cheer for many, Christmas can be hard for those who have lost loved ones. This year, especially, I understand why. She went on to pay tribute to Philip. Quote, I have drawn great comfort from the warmth and affection of the many tributes to his life and work from around the country, the Commonwealth, and the world. His sense of service, intellectual curiosity, and capacity to squeeze fun out of any situation, were all irrepressible. That mischievous, inquiring twinkle was as bright at the end as when I first set eyes on him. Close quote. So, as the Queen moves toward her Platinum Jubilee in February of 2022, she does so without her beloved husband at her side. We will talk more about the Jubilee and why it is such a major event in royal history, in the weeks ahead. In fact, I'm thrilled to share that I'll have Tracy Borman join us this month to talk about the Queen's Jubilee and her marvelous new book, Crown and Scepter. Definitely stay tuned. And now on to number nine, royal executions. Specifically, the executions of two of the most famous women in British history, Anne Boleyn and Mary Queen of Scots. These two women are far too interesting to reduce them to the way they died. That said, however, the fact and manner of their deaths are incredibly important from a historical perspective. 
So let's take a few minutes to consider the executions of Anne Boleyn and Mary Queen of Scots. Although Anne had technically been stripped of her title as queen, many people still thought of her as queen, and she had been crowned queen. So I think it's still appropriate to say that Anne Boleyn was the first queen of England to be executed publicly. We know a bit about the king's direct involvement thanks to a National Archives document that head of medieval records Dr. Sean Cunningham shared with Tracy Borman. Tracy describes Henry VIII's role in planning Anne's execution as premeditated and calculating, referring to Anne as his, quote, late queen of England, lately our wife, lately attainted and convicted of high treason. Henry emphasizes that, quote, we command that the head of the same Anne shall be cut off. Whew! Why did Henry take the unusual and unrepeated step of sending for a French swordsman, an expert in beheading, to execute this woman he had once loved? I don't think it was about pity or showing a bit of mercy or Anne's previous connections to France. Having someone beheaded was sometimes a messy business requiring more than one blow of the axe. The potential of a bloody execution would have been worrisome for Henry, I believe. He was so careful in his instruction and so concerned about the appearance of the event. I think that's why he opted for the more reliable French executioner. Henry thought that the means of execution would make him look merciful and in control. I don't think it was really about mercy. I think it was about appearance, a clean kill. I think sending his second wife to her death unleashed demons in the king that would never be put to rest until his own death, 11 years, four wives, and numerous executions later. And what about Mary, Queen of Scots? It's a little ironic that the daughter of Anne Boleyn would send the Scottish queen to her death. After being Queen of Scotland and Queen Consort of France, a couple of disastrous marriages and a forced abdication sent Mary to Elizabeth's England in 1568. Everything changed for both women when Mary arrived. She was a constant threat to Elizabeth's reign, the rallying cry and alternative for Catholics in England and throughout Europe. And numerous rebellions were launched with the aim of assassinating Elizabeth and installing Mary on the English throne. Eventually, Mary was implicated, arrested, tried, and found guilty of treason. After months of stalling, Elizabeth signed the death warrant, then, according to her report, instructed that the warrant not be carried out. <clears throat> Elizabeth's counsel wasn't having it. Cecil moved immediately, and Mary's execution was carried out within a week. On the 8th of February, 1587, Mary was executed at Fotheringhay Castle. The execution was huge news across Catholic Europe, and there are a few contemporary reports. Unlike Anne Boleyn, Mary was not beheaded by a French swordsman. Instead, according to reports, it took three blows of the axe to remove her head, creating the very scene of horror that Henry VIII had managed to avoid. The executioner then held up her head, calling out, God save Queen Elizabeth. But her head fell away, and he was left holding just her wig, a red wig that had hidden her gray hair for years. The final tragic moment was when her little dog appeared from under her skirts and tried to stay with her after her death. Mary's fame continued to grow, especially after her death, and she was mourned as a Catholic mortar across Europe and by many in England. And in a final twist, her son and successor on the Scottish throne became Elizabeth I's successor on the English throne, James VI of Scotland and I of England. Now coming in at number eight, the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic was one of the biggest and most state-of-the-art ocean liners of its time. It represented not only the essence of what technology and industry could offer, it offered luxury, elegance, and a kind of floating paradise that almost seemed to defy reality. It included what were considered comprehensive safety measures and was deemed unsinkable. Instead of achieving that distinction, it came to represent one of the most tragic voyages of history. It has also been called a cautionary tale about the dangers of pride. For its maiden voyage, the Titanic held more than 1,300 passengers, about half of which were in third class. This was just more than half of the number of passengers the ship was designed to accommodate. Many prominent people were aboard, including American millionaire John Jacob Astor and his wife Madeline Force Astor, industrialist Benjamin Guggenheim, 
Macy's owner, Isidore Strauss, and his wife, Ida Strauss, millionaires Molly Brown, and many more. The ship left Southampton the 10th of April, 1912. The next day it left Ireland and headed for New York Pier 59. There were warnings around the waters in Newfoundland, but Captain Edward Smith was concerned about making good time and decided to remain at full speed. At the time, many believed ice warnings were merely advisories and not indicative of any real danger. It was nearly midnight on the 14th of April when a lookout spotted an iceberg ahead of of the Titanic and alerted the bridge. The first officer ordered a change of course and reversal of engines, but it was too late. The ship struck the iceberg, creating dents in the hull that made the seams separate. Water flooded in, and the ship began to sink. The belief that such ships were largely unsinkable probably led to the inadequate response. There were enough lifeboats for only about half the passengers on board, and the crew was not trained in how to operate them. Some lifeboats were launched only half full, and others were overloaded and floundered. The ship began to sink faster as the deck dipped below water, and it broke apart. The passengers who remained, including nearly all the third-class passengers, were immersed in the freezing water. Eventually, little more than 700 people survived and were taken to New York by the Carpathia. At least 1,500 people perished, and some survivors died soon after arriving in New York from injuries and exposure. The sinking of this unsinkable ship led to several changes in the safety of sea voyages. The International Ice Patrol now monitors and reports the location of North Atlantic Ocean icebergs that pose potential threats to sea traffic. It has operated every year, except for the time of World War I and World War II, since 1913, and there has not been loss of life due to a collision with an iceberg. Several movies and documentaries have been made about the Titanic, and it is forever a part of our cultural memory. Now at number seven, we have Elizabeth I's famous speech at Tilbury. The death of Mary, Queen of Scots, had not extinguished the the desire of France, Spain, and the Pope to remove Elizabeth and place a Catholic on the throne of England. In fact, it spurred Philip of Spain to launch his famous armada against England in an attempt to invade the country, rally English Catholics to rise up against their queen, and overthrow Elizabeth and her government. The Pope was hopeful of Philip's success, but was also impressed by the English queen herself. He told an ambassador that, quote, were she a Catholic, she would be our most beloved, for she is of great worth, end quote. Even so, he agreed to pay Philip an enormous sum in support of his efforts, only after the Spanish forces prevailed. What happened? Certainly the, event, the efforts of Drake and Elizabeth's so-called sea dogs contributed to the delay of the Armada, and the Spanish suffered from poor planning and bad strategies. But the weather was the real catalyst in the victory. Storms wreaked havoc on the Spanish fleet, but fear of invasion remained high, and Robert Dudley was put in charge of the army at Tilbury. He arranged for Elizabeth to visit and rally the troops. It was here that she gave one of her most famous speeches. Even without cable news, social media, or TikTok, we have a copy of that speech. The British Library holds a document that is a contemporary record of the Queen's speech. You can see it on the library website. I'll include a link in the show notes. It's in this speech where the queen declares herself to have the body of a, quote, weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too, end quote. She goes on to say that she thinks it, quote, foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonor shall grow of me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. End quote. We know that the Armada ships had already been fatally weakened, weakened and were on their way back to Spain when the Queen made the speech. Still, it was important at the time, and it reinforced Elizabeth's ongoing attempts to prove she was capable of ruling despite her gender. As Philip had described his campaign as a, quote, holy war, it was easy for the English to use the weather as a sign of God's will. The Tudor propaganda machine went to work, and the Armada medals bore the inscription, Flavat Yehovah et Dissipatissons, God blew, and they were scattered. The Armada became a symbol of Elizabeth as Gloriana, complete with the multiple copies of the Armada portrait that show her as supremely victorious. It was, 
an important moment for England on the European stage and for Elizabeth, staking her claim as queen. Her Catholic subjects had not risen up against her, and she had held her throne against larger and better funded adversaries. Now here we are with number five, the glorious revolution and the fake news event that kicked it off, the warming pan baby scandal. Despite my well-documented obsession with the Tudors, I am delighted to see that the Stuarts are grabbing attention as well. We're joining the Stuart dynasty during the reign of James II. He had been first married to Anne Hyde, who bore him two daughters. Although James himself was Catholic, he agreed that daughters Mary and Anne would be raised as Protestants. And since Mary would succeed him, that settled the ruffled feathers about James being a Catholic king. However, after Anne Hyde's death, James married again, this time to the Catholic Mary of Modena. But even though Mary had children, none survived, and the people were satisfied that the Protestant princess would succeed her father on the throne. Mary of Modena threw all this into chaos when she gave birth to a healthy baby boy, James Francis Edward, on the 10th of June, 1688. As a son, the baby immediately leapfrogged over his two half-sisters in the line of succession, and he became heir to the throne. That meant a Catholic heir. Parliament's powerful Protestants were not about to let that happen. The laws of the time didn't actually forbid a Catholic succession, so their only hope was to convince everyone that the royal baby wasn't really royal. The story went out that, despite the number of government officials who had been there and observed the birth of James Francis Edward, Mary had in fact miscarried or not really been pregnant or maybe the baby had died. In any case, there was no baby. So Mary had smuggled in an imposter in a warming pan. There was no way to accept this argument on its merits. It required an agreement that gaining a Protestant ruler was worth agreeing to live a lie. Parliament reached out to Princess Mary's husband, William of Orange, and asked him to invade England on behalf of his wife. Princess Mary sided with her husband over her father, and her sister, Princess Anne, did as well. James II sent his wife and young son to France for safety and tried to rally his troops in England to stave off the invasion. But his military was convinced to support William and Mary. Eventually, James fled to France as well. That created an alternative royal family, and for years, Jacobite supporters attempted to return James Francis Edward, later known as the Old Pretender, and eventually his son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, to the throne. But those attempts were unsuccessful. William and Mary took the throne according to the terms set out by Parliament. This included the Declaration of, Lo of Rights, later called the Bill of Rights, and passed into law in 1689. The relationship between monarch and Parliament was changed forever. And we still feel the effects of the Glorious Revolution today. The stipulation that a monarch cannot marry a Catholic was not reversed until 2015. And a Roman Catholic still cannot become the monarch. That law came into being because of the Glorious Revolution, which was kicked off by the warming pan baby scandal. And now let's look at some of the events of 2021 that made your list. I'm carrying on in my own numbering. So for memorable moment number five, we have online programming. I know I'm not alone. When I say the last two years, 2021 and 2020 have been tough, really tough. Illness and death and isolation and lockdown and crushing loneliness and fear tough. And as we try to carry on and move forward, it's been helpful to have some things come along that cheer us up and make us feel more connected. Thank you to all the organizations and individuals who have made such creative efforts to bring us programming online. Since we're talking about British history here, and since I know many listeners like me are absolutely aching to get back to Britain, I especially appreciate organizations bringing British history into our homes. For example, are you feeling sad, or in my case, totally gutted, that you can't attend the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots exhibition at the British Library? Well, then I hope you've joined me in taking advantage of their online programs. You can take an online tour of the exhibition. You can check out videos of past events. You can see items online. The British Library website is definitely your friend right now, and I encourage you to explore. They offer talks, 
courses, and all kinds of things to keep us sane until we can walk into that magical space once more. Are you missing the Tower of London and Hampton Court? Oh, me too. So be sure to check out Historic Royal Palace's Crowdcast events. Lucy Worsley is joined by all kinds of fascinating people who share what they're doing. You'll hear from curators, historians, and others. Did you celebrate Christmas with Victoria and Albert? Did you walk through the last days of Anne Boleyn? It's amazing what they're offering. And here is a personal plug from me to join places like Historic Royal Palaces and the British Library as a member. It's even more important now to support cultural organizations like these. We, not, we may not be able to be there in person, but we can be there in spirit. So those are just a couple of my favorite online offerings. What have you been watching and listening to during these tough years? I'd love to hear from you. Let's share our resources and find all kinds of new ways of connecting. More of 2021 with number four, the marvelous and stunning discovery in Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours by the equally marvelous and stunning Kate McCaffrey at Hever Castle. I was thrilled to have Kate join me in episode 75. If you haven't listened yet, you must. She is wonderful in every way. She talked about how she was able to uncover unknown inscriptions in the religious book owned by Anne Boleyn. Using these inscriptions, Kate was able to identify a network of Anne's friends and supporters who worked together to keep her book safe. Kate's research unlocked a personal side of Anne Boleyn and her life that we hadn't been able to see before. Kate studied the printed prayer book that once belonged to Anne and is now part of the collection at Hever Castle, Anne Boleyn's childhood home, and one time Boleyn family headquarters. Before Kate's discovery, the only known inscription in the book was Anne's own couplet, Remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day. But on closer inspection and using ultraviolet light and photo editing software, Kate uncovered parcel transcriptions of four other inscriptions that had later been erased. Using the information, Kate put together a provenance of this book, revealing a network of the mostly women who kept the book safe after Anne's dramatic fall. The book also reveals connections to other important women in Anne's story. Kate discovered that the edition of the prayer book that Anne owned was also owned by Catherine of Aragon. Catherine's copy is now held at the Morgan Library in New York. In other words, these two rival queens shared the same copy of a book of hours and likely read it in each other's company at court. The timing of the book's printing means it came into their possession when Anne was becoming a star of the court, the time of greatest strife between them. And yet, at this pivotal moment, as Kate points out, they were linked by worship and prayer. Kate identified Elizabeth Hill as the likely person Anne passed her book of hours directly to. Elizabeth was born and raised near Heber. Her daughter Mary married one of Elizabeth I's tutors, and Mary became a valued friend and attendant during Elizabeth I's reign. The friendship between Mary and Queen Elizabeth echoed the friendship of their mothers. Since Elizabeth Hill had the book, Kate points out how likely it is to imagine that Mary would have shared the book with Queen Elizabeth. Although we may never know for sure if Elizabeth I actually held that book that was so important to her mother, Kate's research makes it possible for us to imagine that emotional connection between Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I. And who knows what Kate's ongoing research will uncover next. Stay tuned. For us, on to another favorite 2021 moment, once again featuring Anne Boleyn. Antique dealer Paul Fitzsimmons purchased a carved bird for 75 pounds in 2019. He was convinced it was something special, even though it was covered in black, probably soot. He noticed the crown and scepter and realized it must be a royal bird. When he cleaned up the object, he was able to compare it to a drawing from Hampton Court Palace, which had been dramatically renovated during Henry VIII's courtship of an early marriage to Anne Boleyn. The object, originally simply identified as, quote, antique carved wooden bird, has now been authenticated as Anne Boleyn's heraldic album emblem. It probably was originally placed in her royal private apartments at Hampton Court and is something she would have looked at frequently. Tracy Borman said it was amazing to be in the same room with something that would have been so familiar to Anne herself. 
She described seeing the object in person and thinking how it would have fit right in to Hampton Court was a, quote, shivers down the spine moment. Like the Book of Hours, which was kept safe after Anne's fall from favor, it's easy to imagine that this falcon was removed and kept safe probably by supporters of Anne. In fact, thinking about the removal of the falcon from its place of glory, just as Anne was coming to her tragic and violent end, Fitzsimmons said, quote, This could have been removed literally as Anne Boleyn was about to have her head cut off. It's a stark image, but the survival of the falcon is a reminder of Anne's supporters and how history continues to reach out to us today. And now I'm coming to a couple of memorable moments of my own. Memorable moment number two is a huge shout out to my patrons. I was hesitant to start a patron program, just as I was hesitant to start the podcast itself. But I have so many friends and supporters who have been so encouraging, I took a chance and did it. I want to thank all my patrons. Your support means the world to me. There are a few special people in particular who regularly reach out and share their thoughts and ideas with me, and I want to give them a special shout out. And please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Get in touch and correct me. Lauren Watson, Margot Thorson, Helen Gibson, Christine Hyman, Leah Padiglioli, and Robin Malay. Thank you so much. There are lots of treats in store for patrons in 2022. So if you've been thinking about it, now is a great time to join the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics patron family. And of course, my number one favorite memorable moment of all time, at least for this year, is being so blessed to be shaking up history with you. I want to thank each of you for listening, for sending me ideas, asking questions, for rating the podcast and leaving comments. I so appreciate your support and encouragement. I'm grateful beyond measure that you are sharing this journey to the past with me. So as we embark on 2022, let's make history and keep shaking up history together. 